All right, so the plan in this video is to kind of finish this, uh, uh, finish our kind of beginning analysis of some of the order theoretic properties of the ordinals. And the way that we're going to do this is by proving that this relation that we defined on the ordinals is total. So in other words, so what's what's today, what's on today's agenda? Um, we're going to prove, so here's a proposition. It's that, well, if you have any two ordinals, um, so maybe if, if alpha and beta are ordinals, well, then either, uh, so either, well, either alpha is an element of beta, and we denoted this as alpha is less than beta, um, alpha and beta are equal, or um, beta is an element of alpha, so beta is less than alpha. So in other words, the relation on the, ordinal, uh, on the ordinals is total. I'm going to say the relation, the relation on the ordinals is total. So why am I putting relation in air quotes? Well, the next thing we're going to do kind of follows from our previous discussions is that there's actually no set of all ordinals. It's called the Borali porti paradox. We'll do this after we finish this proposition. And well, what is a relation? Uh, I guess very formally, a relation is a set, right? It's a subset of the Cartesian product of our set. But if there is no set of ordinals, um, well, th it doesn't make sense to say that the relation, that, that, that it doesn't make sense to say that this is a relation, right? Because it won't be a set if there is no set of all ordinals more of a technical point but like you know morally it's a it, it is a relation um, and what we just argue is that it's that it's total okay so what's the proof of this well we're going to use our previous results so last time what did we prove uh, last time last time we argued that this membership relation so what does this mean this means that either alpha is an element of beta or they're equal this is true if and only if Alpha and beta, alpha is a subset of beta. This is going to be pretty nice, uh, and it's going to be pretty uh, useful for us in proving this. Okay, so what's the proof of our proposition? What's the proof? Well, um, let alpha and beta be ordinals. So fix, fix alpha and beta ordinals. And well, without loss of generality, we can just assume that, or, or like, you know, if it was the case that alpha was a subset of beta, then we're done, right, by um, our, our proposition from last time. So if if alpha is a subset of beta, well, we win, right? Because then it would be that alpha is a um, less than or equal to beta, which means that either one of these two cases holds. So what we're going to do is assume that alpha is not a subset of beta. So uh, assume uh, alpha is not a subset of beta. And well, what we're going to try to argue is that alpha is uh, bigger than beta. So in other words, beta is an element of alpha. Um, so I guess what's going to happen here, maybe if we want to think about a picture. Well, here's zero. And then um, well, beta is going to be right here. And alpha is going to be right here. And the argument is actually going to be fairly the same type of an argument, where if it's not, if it's the case where that alpha is not a subset of beta, what well, must be true, there has to be some element of alpha that's not an element of beta. So maybe we'll call this thing gamma. There's going to be some element of alpha that's not an element of beta. Well, we can take make gamma be the least element of alpha that's not an element of beta. And we'll just argue that gamma and beta are equal to each other. So assume that alpha is not a subset of beta. So um, since, uh, uh, so there's some least so I'm epsilon least element gamma. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll write it out like this. Will be so. So uh, maybe I'll write it out. Like, we'll kind of write it out more formally. So the set S maybe what is this going to be? This is going to be all the gamma in alpha such that gamma is not an element of beta. This thing is non-empty, right? Just by definition of subset. And so in particular, 
Well, alpha is a is well ordered by epsilon. There has to be a, an epsilon least element. So, um, fix fix the least the epsilon least element, say gamma of s. Okay, so this is um. What do we know about gamma? Well, it's in alpha, and it's not an element of beta. So this is going to be really kind of important for us in a second. But one thing that we can maybe observe is, well, uh, the first thing that we can maybe argue, and similar, this is kind of similar to the previous argument, is that, well, it has to be that gamma is a subset of beta. So note, gamma is a subset of beta. Why? Well, if, if say, theta is an element of gamma, well, then, since alpha is transitive, it must be that theta is in alpha. And so it also must be the case because gamma is the least element of S. It must be that, well, theta is not an S. And so what this implies is that theta is in beta. This is the only other option. So kind of why, why is this whole statement true? Why is, it, why is this true? Well, it kind of follows from this kind of chain of arrows. Well, what can we say from this? Well, gamma is a is less is a subset of beta. So by our previous proposition, what do we know? Um, so by last time, by last time, what do we know? It has to be the case then that gamma is less than or equal to beta. Okay, but well, what do we know about gamma? Gamma is in S. So since since gamma is an element of S. Well, it has to be that gamma is not less than beta. Why? Well, gamma is, uh, what does it mean to be less than? It means that you're an element of. And well, gamma is not an element of beta, so it has to be that gamma is not less than beta. Well, what does this mean? This means that either gamma is an element of beta or it's equal to beta. Well, it can't be less than beta, so it must be that gamma and beta are equal. So gamma is equal to beta. Um, but then we're done. Why are we done? Well, gamma is an element of alpha, and so then beta would be an element of alpha. Okay. All right, so what did we just argue? We just argued that the relation on the ordinals is total. If you have any two ordinals, uh, either one is less than the other or vice versa. So the picture now, like maybe this is, uh, the, the, the justified uh, picture of the ordinals is, well, it's a really long line. And this isn't, uh, I, I'm, I'm by line, maybe I don't mean that there's stuff in between. You're going to start with, say, zero. Zero is going to be our smallest ordinal. And then it's going to be one and then two. There's nothing in between them. I'm just kind of uh, using the line to make sure it's straight. And then uh, uh, we have three. And then it's going to keep on going. And the, well, at some point, we're going to exhaust all the natural numbers. And what we're left with next is omega. It's kind of our first infinite ordinal. Well, and then we're going to be able to add one and then two and then so on. And well, we're never going to deviate from this line, right? At some point, maybe we end up at this, we end up at this ordinal alpha, and we're going to have some other ordinal all the way down here. Maybe this is going to be uh, beta. But if you have any two ordinals, they have to appear somewhere on this line. And well, uh, what we're going to argue right now is that there is no set of all of the ordinals. Uh, so this line is what's called a proper class. Right, there's no uh, collection, there's no set of everything, but somehow it's it makes sense to talk about all the ordinals at once, right? Because we can define what an ordinal is. Um, okay, so what's so this is called the Borali Forti paradox. Borali Forti paradox. And I, I I personally think of paradox here as like counterintuitive. Um, doesn't mean that it's false. It just means that it's counterintuitive. Uh, counterintuitive. What's the claim? It's that there is no. Um, uh, so, and this is kind of a corollary of the previous kind of conversation. Is that there is no set of all ordinals. There's no set. There's no set. You know, call it big omega of all ordinals. Well, what's the proof? Well, we're going to argue that if there were, it would actually itself be an ordinal. 
and we'll see why this is a contradiction. So the first thing is, well, gamma is going to be, uh, so assume otherwise. And so that means that there is some set. Uh, so we can write maybe, so then in other words, this, so a set of all ordinals. is a set. Well, we're going to try to argue that it's or, uh, an ordinal. How can we do this? Well, the first thing we can say is that, well, gamma, uh, uh, omega would have to be transitive. So it's transitive. Why is this true? Well, if we have an element of, uh, if, if we have an element of omega, well, what we'd have to argue is that it's actually a subset of omega. But why is this true? Well, we've proved already that if we have an ordinal, all of its elements are ordinals. So this is true. Since, since every, uh, uh, since alpha would be the set of all ordinals that came before it. So all the beta such that uh, beta is an ordinal. And beta is less than alpha. Right, we proved already that all of an, the elements of an ordinal are other ordinals. So then, another, in other words, all of its elements would be an element of omega, which would tell us that alpha is actually a subset of omega. Um, and so what's the other kind of uh, thing that we need to check? Well, in order to prove that something's an ordinal, well, we can show that it's transitive and well-ordered by epsilon, but we can also check that it's a transitive set of transitive sets. And I guess... You can show that the ordering is total, but we also actually proved that uh, being a transitive set of transitive sets just implies that the uh, that the ordering is total. But um, uh, so so it's not really going to matter. But what's this other condition that we need to check? We need to check that omega all of omega's elements. So for every element of omega, um, well, it's transitive. Well, why is this true? Well, it's because all of omega's elements are ordinals, and, well, ordinals are transitive by definition. Um, why is this true? So this is since ordinals are transitive by definition. And then the last thing, I guess it's not, uh, we don't really need this, but it's good to mention as well that this ordering is total right and and we just we just check this directly so this is total but again we don't we don't need this Th these two uh statements imply would imply the third one um, so what can we say from this um we can say that well therefore uh omega would be an ordinal so so And well, if it's an ordinal, it has to be the case that, well, it's an element of itself. And this is going to be a contradiction, right? On one hand, you, you're, you're able to appeal to foundation. So this would contradict foundation. So this contradicts foundation. Um, but another thing you could say is, well, this statement implies, so let's say that you didn't want to use foundation. What you could say is that this is the same thing as saying that omega is a subset. The set of omega is a subset of omega. Um, but what does this mean? Since omega is supposed to be well-ordered because it's an ordinal, well, this is a non-empty set that doesn't have a least element. So this set. So this would also be a contradiction by saying that this non-empty set has no least element, has no least element. Which would contradict then that omega is actually an ordinal because it's not well ordered by epsilon. And so we've, we've reached a contradiction. Now, um, I guess maybe a comment, why would you maybe prefer this one over the other one? Well, sometimes what happens there are certain, uh, uh, some, sometimes set theorists work with uh, the axioms of ZFC without the axiom of foundation. And 
Well, you can still talk about the ordinals without the foundation, without the axiom of foundation, right? You, you can still define an ordinal as a transitive set that's well ordered by epsilon. You can still prove that the empty set is an ordinal, and so on. You don't get these. You don't get this characterization of the ordinals without transition, uh, without uh, foundation. So, in other words, uh, you'd have to maybe prove something a little bit different. But in in that set in that setting, you can still prove that there can't be a set of all ordinals. And well, in that case, the contradiction wouldn't be to appealing to foundation. It would be appealing to this little piece right here. So uh, just as kind of a, an aside, but uh, yeah, so that's Borali 40. Um, what we're going to do, what we're, we're, we're going to start doing in the next video is start defining uh, ordinal arithmetic and uh, kind of work our way towards talking about cardinals. So um, see everyone in the next video.